Welcome back, my beautiful listeners. I am so joyful that you have found your way to this episode with Kate Alec. Now, I know that the title is super provocative, Death Doula, and a lot of you are probably just sitting on the edge of your seat curious about what is like, what is the goings-ons of a death doula. And to be honest, that's the same attitude I went into this episode with, but about 30 minutes in, I completely forgot that I was hosting and I became a witness and if it's possible, an even bigger fan of this incredible woman to be a woman who can sit like the mountain and hold the space that one needs for their transformation to the other side. That takes an incredible amount of love, patience, perseverance, and that's what this episode truly became. I know that I have been telling you guys every week that super soon Violet Paper Wings by Fellow Hollow is going to be dropping and you guys, it officially is here. It came, the album has dropped and it is out everywhere. I mean, you can find it where you stream or download the album at fellowhollow.bandcamp.com. It is majestic as fuck. Every song is so unique and beautiful and transcending. You guys, I just, I can't get enough of it. I hope that you guys go and give it a listen. Seriously, it's so rad. And go and follow these guys on Instagram because I'm telling you, they are the shit. (laughs) Okay, December. How did it get to be December already? Seriously. I mean, mentally, I feel as though time has been standing still. But physically, guys, it is so showing on my skin, which is why I am headed to Spa True this month because I am all about that microneedling and those lush facials that feed and rejuvenate my skin. Now, each month, Spa True has some truly fantastic deals and promotions going on, and you want to get in on that. And with Christmas just around the corner, why not take the guessing out of your gifts and purchase a gift card or a package for a loved one? Or better yet, get down with your deserving self and make an appointment. To find out more about this month's amazing, fantastic deals, call or email at www.spotrue.com. That's www.spatru.com or 1-844-4-SPA-TRUE. That's 1-844-477-2878. And I hope to see you guys there because I know that's where I'm headed this month too. So I'm going to do something a little bit different, you guys. I am going to take a minute before we head into this episode to read to you from Kate's own biography, a little intro into this magnificent woman. So here is Kate in her own words, read by myself. A long time ago, a woman and a man made love in a canoe. During their encounter, the canoe tipped over and they landed in the lake. Nine months later, the good Irish Catholic woman gave birth to a child. She won the Navy officer in marriage My journey began in her shame and guilt. We tried to be friends in this lifetime. It was a difficult love. I was 64 years old before I became clear enough to say that my father raped me. It took that long for me to recognize that it wasn't my fault, my wish, or that my being was the cause of this experience. I remember the moment of penetration. For a long time in life, I wondered what happened to the bloody underwear. Did she wash it? Did he throw it in the fire? How could something so precious, so impactful, so significant, be invisible? 
A violent atmosphere filled the air I breathed as a child until I ran for life. I remember the warm spread of urine on the seat beneath me in the court that day. I saw him again as he walked past me up to the stand. Institutions and many, many foster homes were the places I lived. I had learned how to run, so I ran and ran. I drugged and I loved and I searched for God and I traveled to the Philippines. I got lost and found and lost again. Eventually, I married, had children. Then children died and part of me with them. My marriage died too. Somehow, I found myself going to school. I loved books. Reading was stalwart support. I learned I could learn. Eventually, I was enveloped into anatomy and physiology, nursing and healing, being with someone who was afraid, terrified, lost, alone, brought the best part of me into life. Since this time, I have found the learning into indigenous cosmologies across Turtle Island and to China and Israel. I have completed a bachelor's degree and at the end of a master's degree currently. I have been initiated into the Karo Mesa traditions. I have fostered, fasted for many years. I listen to the teachings of Baha'u'llah and attempt to integrate a universal cosmology of living. I work within community with grassroots projects and elevating the voices of women and children. I am leaning into the clarity and grace that balances oppression into transmutation of the current decay and disconnection process of human evolution. I am married to a man that I love like breath. I am calling forward all healing that will leave my children with access to their innate sovereignty and freedom. And most days I laugh and I find myself smiling. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so Rayanne here. I just want to first off, I want to take the moment to introduce my amazing friend, Kate Alec, who is joining us here on the podcast Focus Forward today. Um, thank you, Kate, so much for, for coming on and taking time out of your day to be with us here. And I'm going to say thank you for having the conversation. Ah, wonderful. Um, so for those of you who don't know, which is going to be everybody, <laughs> Uh, I first was introduced to Kate through one of my good friends, Kim, and, and the introduction I got was, oh my goodness, you have to meet this incredible, amazing woman. You know, uh, I know her through the friendship center. And of course I was like, I don't know what a friendship center is, but keep going. And she goes, and she's a death doula. And I'm like, I also <laughs> do not know what that is. Okay. Can, can you just tell us before we get going? too far ahead. What is a friendship center and what is a death doula? <laughs> Wonderful. Good questions. Um, friendship centers are an association of people who come together to provide support for Indigenous people living in urban centers. And in Canada, there are friendship centers across the country. So it's a national movement towards supporting those who are no longer living on reserve, who have been dispossessed, who have, uh, due to uh, residential school perhaps, mm -hmm. never been able to come back home uh, or haven't found their way home, or maybe they are close to their, their home communities but haven't found a way to integrate back on, uh, onto, into that community, or they just want to live in the city, you know, in a, in a more urban um situation. 
Right. So um, it's a collective movement and, and it's a political movement in terms of people being able to um, um, advance an agenda politically and the, on the national level because okay. they've collected their, they can do that collectively. And why is that so important? I mean, you know, for people outside of Canada, just hearing about friendship centers and for the people inside of Canada, just hearing about friendship centers. I know even myself, um, you know, I, I come, my background is indigenous heritage and, and I had never heard about a friendship center before. And I also, until I was in my thirties, I did not know much about the residential schools and why it's so important that friendship centers were created. So can you tell us more about why they were created? Well, I mean, I honestly would need to uh, delve into that specifically to get a lot of the really juicy, good details. But I certainly know in a general way that uh, in Canada, we have a very paternalistic uh, government in terms of their position around uh, ownership of uh, the care and and um, best outcome for indigenous people historically there's they from the king when when people came to settle here in this part of the continent, the king sent them out to discover the land and their perspective when they came here was terra nulla there's no no people here mm. it's a doctor discovery said that there were no humans that lived here all of this land belonged to the king and every bit of canadian law is based on that primary concept and that concept is embedded within a not a canadian mentality right their perception of themselves as canadians is based on that whether they know it or not is based on that principle everything is owned by the king and nothing that was here was there were no people here, so there was no ownership of any or any relationship um, of the people with the land. Okay. So our law is based on that and how money is uh, allocated from the taxes that people send to the government and that money being reallocated out into the nation, that money goes to, in a paternalistic way, it goes to residentially informed organizational structures we call bands chief Mm. and councils okay and that money then says if i am an individual who is uh, a captain band band member that money i am i have some portion of that money that went to my band that is allocated for my best interest Okay, but if that an accountant person happened to be transported to Arizona as part of the boxcar, um, the kids that were boxcar down there and out of Canada to be sent into the communities there, okay. or they were put in residential schools that were away from their home community, mm-hmm. and they're trying to find their way home all these years later and they live in the cities, there is no access for support for them. Right. If they live in an urban center, downtown east side, maybe, or or Little Wit, downtown Little Wit. Mm-hmm. Um, if somebody who is uh, Nishka or Haida lives in Little Wit, any, any, you know, Ojibwe, anybody lives in Lillooet, how do they have access to that support that is they're entitled to, according to the government, when they live in the city? So the friendship centers were developed mm-hmm. years ago to start to have a voice for those people who were dispossessed in those ways. And as I said earlier, because it's a collective movement, that voice is heard at the national level in terms of political debate. So, I mean, maybe I'm making just a wild jump, which I do a lot. Um, I, I make these insane jumps, and so it can be sometimes really hard to follow my train of thought for those listening. But I would imagine that being a, and forgive me if, if this is the wrong word for it, I mean, perhaps you have a different word that you call it, but being a death doula at a friendship center, just having that background 
must be, um, you know, honestly, just at the end of the day, it, it must be really good to have that skill set uh, when you're working with the um, Indigenous culture and with the friendship centers, because there is so much generational trauma, and um, you know, there, I my understanding is is that there is a lot of uh, unnecessary, or maybe not unnecessary, but um, really unfortunate deaths that that happen uh, amongst the bands and and within the community itself. So, how does how does you know, being a death doula, how does that help you or how has that helped you working at the Friendship Center? Okay, you're right. That's a jump. <laughs> <laughs> That's just how my brain works. <laughs> okay. Um, because uh, just some background information in yeah. terms of the skill sets that I bring to the position that I, I hold within this particular Friendship Center is that I have 40 plus years as a nurse. Mm-hmm. I've worked in community in hospitals. I've done ER work. I've done. I've helped birthing. I have been in ER. I'm um, sorry, uh, operating rooms. I've I've helped in oncology. I've done a lot of elder care. And my husband and myself, we had um, an adult family home for eight years, and oh, wow. took care of eight people in our home over those years, um, twenty four hours a day. So we have a lot of background experience. Along with that, um, I also have a social work degree. And I've been a social worker since the 80s, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, as well, along with the nursing. So, you know, it's for me, it's a, a combination of experience, skills that have been developed from experience in different settings over time. And um, not... Too long ago, I went and got a uh, teaching degree. <clears throat> I went to China for two years, and I taught in uh, uh, primary schools, and I taught in uh, university, and I also taught doctors who were going to be coming out of China uh, into different countries and help them with their cultural um, learning. How you know how the difference of cultural perspectives. So um, I a combination of all of that brought me to a place that when the Friendship Center was looking for a coordinator for a project called Empowering Indigenous Women for Stronger Communities, my skill set fit what they were looking for. So that's basically how I started working at the Friendship Center. And in that, we provided workshops for women building capacity within our community at a grassroots level for for women to be able to recognize their own uh, growth. These women who were in this program had dealt with their addiction issues, perhaps, or or, uh, issues from their childhood, and they were ready to start bringing a voice, Mm. their voice up and out into the community against violence. Okay. Wow. So that was a very specific program. It was a national competition. There were only two uh, communities awarded that um, proposal, uh, ourselves and one in the East Coast. Okay. And uh, we provided those workshops to actually start to have, because we are an isolated community in a way, We, mm-hmm. we it's three hours in any direction for us to get to a, a, a city. Uh, to build capacity right here in our community to deal with the issues that we deal with right here in our community. Now, the place where the deaf doula comes in that I I really, and I, again, I want to just say that that title or that languaging is yeah. really new. It, it's like uh, people have been helping people die in their homes for generations upon generations upon generations. Mm -hmm. And so now there's this movement towards professionalizing that work, making it a niche, somewhat like midwives for birthing. Okay. Uh, And the midwives really uh, advocated against us using death midwifery, which would be my preference. Okay. Um, they, and so legally, the courts have said we can't use that language. Mm. Uh, so now we're called death doulas, and there's a, a development around regulation and policy and, you know, uh, 
um, le- legitimizing that practice. Okay. Which is unfortunate because we don't need any of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dying is something that happens for every single person on the planet. And uh, our our relationship with that process is a natural one. And it, it, it it, it, it serves everybody when we approach that death as a life process as a natural continuation of what life has to offer. And uh, to make it a profession is, I think we, we're missing something in that. So, um, but where I can see a benefit of that thinking in, in the Friendship Center is especially around COVID, um, had this virus um, came come into our community in the way that we thought it might initially, mm-hmm. and we were <clears throat> faced with helping people die in their home from COVID. Right. How were how are we going to do that? Mm. How, in what ways are we prepared to help the the family members of folks affected with COVID? to be able to provide that kind of support in home for someone through that intense kind of disease process. And we're not prepared for that. And the people in the community are not prepared for that. And if you need a ventilator, if you live in Littlewood, it's a three hour drive in the back of an ambulance to Camelot Hmm. when you can't breathe. Do you think... so we we need to be able to address these kinds of issues within our community and build that grassroots capability to address those sorts of issues. So that's where it could be of service at the Friendship Center, I think. Do you think, though, you know, and, and again, this is just me kind of going off track, which I like to do a lot, that part of the disconnect with that that a lot of people have surrounding death has to do with the disconnect from mother nature and and from being, you know, recognizing that we are a part of an ecosystem, not an ego system. And, you know, I I mean, that's, that's just me. I was raised on a farm for the most part when, you know, growing up and I was around a ton of death, you know, and death does not bother me. Death does not frighten me. Um, You know, I've, I've seen a lot more, I think, than a lot of people I know. And I view death as a transition personally. And and I would imagine that, you know, playing the role or not playing the role, but being able to participate and help people in with what you do, um, you know, especially in instance with the COVID nineteen that uh is kind of going around the going around the world, you know, that that you would have a special place, especially during now, but also with the amount of um, disconnect from life that I th- I feel that a lot of indigenous communities are still a part of, you know, a part of that separation where we're trying to find, not maybe find our voice, but reconnect with our inner knowing and our, you know, um, and not so much recovering perhaps, but learning to let go of the trauma and step back into living our lives as fully as what we are capable of. I mean, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I, so there's a reframe there for me and there's a couple of things in there. One is that's the disconnect from mother, the earth Mm -hmm. and our mother and our resource, our, our source of nurture and sustenance are sort of our source of protection. Mm-hmm. All of that is embedded in the current social culture that we live within because the dominant in our culture are people who were birthed and their cord was cut. Right. That cutting of the cord at birth set a um, has set us up for uh, a disconnect with our source of life as Absolutely. we live. And um, 
I've just recently read about a, a, a cultural process of birthing that allows the placenta to actually stay attached to the baby mm-hmm. until it naturally falls away. And then in that culture, they take that placenta and bury it. And that person goes through their life returning to the place where their placenta is in that connected way all through their life. And at the end of their life, there there is a ceremony that continues that relationship. So imagine us having kind of cut off and, and uh, okay, we are in control of everything that's natural. Mm-hmm. And we've built a society from that place. So there's that. And it's a huge piece. I'm trying to write about it in my master's paper. So that's, um, it, it's uh, exciting for me to have this opportunity to voice this out loud um because it is definitely a struggle with the language in terms of how to describe this and speak about that process but as well the other part that i heard in what you were saying has to do with a disconnect you're talking about that that in the inflection that i heard you refer to is that healing into the old traditional ways returning to the to the uh, knowledge and the and the cultural awareness that is uh, lineage for mm. for indigenous people um, and i i honestly think that together if we just said this is how we're going to do this and inform the systems of how we choose to do the work for our family member, for ourselves, that that would make the change. It's really okay to build that capacity with our, in ourselves to have our voice strong enough to be able to say, no, I am not doing this. My, my elder is not going to the nursing home. That's not what they, they want. Right. I will provide this care. Mm-hmm. This and this is what we need from you to do this well and mercifully and kindly and gently. Yeah. This is what we require. And it, it, there's a, a a willingness to stand in voice and a willingness to take on the responsibility to do that work. Well, I think what's really interesting is that you know, they have, they ha- it is proven through science. And again, I'm not going to have a fact checker for my podcast, but I encourage everybody to fact check the shit out of when I speak. Um, Cause I read a lot and I retain a lot. And then sometimes I misfire, but you know, when it comes to elders, when it comes to our grandparents and our parents and our great grandparents, you know, it has been scientifically proven that when they spend time with the younger generations, that it actually um, helps their, it helps them to thrive. It helps their immunity system. It helps to keep that cognitive presence, you know, and also it teaches what what I found really interesting. I witnessed it with animals and I've also witnessed it with teenagers. You know, the, the new kind of social norm is, you know, to send your child off to elementary school, to send your child to, um, maybe away to boarding school, uh, you know, and we'll circle back and we'll say also to cut the placenta, you know, they cut us, they cut us loose from our, um, from our teachers, from our mentors, from our leaders so, so quickly. And, and, and I will be speaking about this in another podcast with Dr. Paul Tanari, where they actually, you know, the cutting of the placenta, the, and as well as circumcisions and, uh, female genital mutilation, um, there is a, a big body part slave trade going on with that. That's a whole other topic, but also very, you know, I, I think that gives an indication as to why these things happen so quickly when it seems to me that our choices have been swept, you know, swept aside. But when we send our kids off to these schools and it's a bunch of kids raising kids, and I know that in Africa, they witness this with the elephants as well and the poaching of the ivory trade that when kids raise kids, there's a lot more aggression and there are, there's just a lack of community as a result of that. And, and we see that with the elderly that are sent away from us to be sent into homes and we're paying people that we don't know to take care of. Um, not, not that the people that are taking care of them 
aren't doing the very best that they can. But again, there's something to be said, and it's been proven through science, that the elders benefit from the um, from the enthusiasm and the energy of interacting with the young. And, and in that regard, the young learn so much more. You know, they learn through the watching, through the demonstration, through the joining in. They learn through storytelling about that. And that helps shape us as a culture. And I feel like we've really stepped away from that and, and lost that aspect. And so the elderly, you know, I don't believe that they're getting to pass through with as much support and grace as, as what we were able to offer them in, you know, um, in younger years when there was a, a better based community and the same for the children that the kids aren't being raised with the support of the community that they once had. And, and this isn't just about indigenous. I mean, I think this is all around the world. You see this, right? It's kids raising kids and, and elderly dying amongst elderly and this, this interaction. I just feel like, I feel like it would really benefit humanity to take a step back and reintroduce, uh, you know, just a culture of connection, but that's just me. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm speaking out of turn here. What's, what are your thoughts on that, Kate? Um, well, that's a, a lot. Um, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just going to come back to the perspective that I've been working to, to voice, mm-hmm. which is around building capacity within each of us yes. to address the issues that arise in any given day, in any given moment. Where do we let go of our 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 um, the spiritual direction that we have within us? Mm-hmm. When do we let go of that in a moment to allow the system or the they, whoever they are, to tell to to be the director of life? Mm-hmm. And and. It, it has to do with, to, for me personally, yep. it has to do with me being willing to stay present in each moment and being able also to develop that capacity within myself to listen mm-hmm. so that I can hear the connection, to hear that right relationship, to hear um, the ways in which I can. Uh, address whatever challenge is in front of me. You know, I love that you brought that up. Well, I just want to finish by saying to address that challenge in front of me in a way that serves life in that moment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the people who care for elders also in, I mean, say your mother was dying of COVID. Yes. How would you approach that? Because... Honestly, sister, that can happen any day now. Yes, it can. That was something I really had to think about. In some other community out there, it could be your friend, your partner, your parent, your child. Right now, how are you going to address that? Have you even thought about it in the moments that you have a bit of downtime? Have you thought about how would you approach that? What would you do? And what is it that you need to know about doing that so that you could ask the right questions to the right people to get the right resources to be able to address that kind of a challenge Mm. so we have to be able to be present with all the things that are happening i mean today honestly i'm wrestling with uh, a wonderful woman here in the community put out a post around how to protect yourself and and to be smart in the middle of protest and she put out some really good, you know, do this, do this, do this, make sure this happens, uh, make a plan, talk to folks, let them know where you are, you know, just a very step-by-step how to be safe in the middle of a riot. Mm-hmm. And all, all day, honestly, I've been wrestling with, should I put that on my Facebook feed? Because honestly, you know, and this is one of the points she said, is your phone is a cop. Well, that is a new concept that came into my mind. It's never going to go away now. The phone is a cop. That is what that is. So how then do I think my way through 
as a lawyer, as a woman who's willing to stay on the battlefield of what's actually happening every single day, Mm -hmm. how do I think my way through that, that I can present that information safely to my grandchildren who are actually in the United States today in the middle of a riot? What do I do to help them now? You know, I asked myself the same question uh, for the last couple of days, actually, um, you know, there's so much going on. I mean, the date today that we're recording this is May 31st. For those of you who don't know, I'm pre-recording. I've pre-recorded all of these podcast conversations well in advance of dropping them. And today the riots are happening down the United States. We are, you know, I believe we're in month five of COVID, uh, you know, and, for Canada personally, the communities are just starting to open back up with hopes that we won't have a big flare uh, and a resurgence of this um, disease. You know, I thought to myself, and I and I had to have the same conversation when I first found out about COVID. And here's my personal, you know, take on the entire situation, which is, I, in order for me to show up for others, I first need to show up for myself. And showing up to me, what that looks like is, what can I do in this moment, in, on this day, that will help me and my family and our community and humanity tomorrow or even in this moment? And for me, justice, yeah, that's, that's a really big conversation that's taking place on the internet right now. But I believe that taking steps towards inner peace and kindness is the best thing that you can do. And some of the things I see for people showing up for others is so incredible. You know, the way that they're stepping in front of the violence to create a barrier, but I don't see how anger, I understand how anger is a beautiful catalyst. It's a driving force behind the need for change. I understand that. But I also think that so many people are at different stages in their life that everyone has to experience those stages in order to move through in that transition to the next one where I am personally at, and I'm not trying to take away from anybody's rage or anger or their, um, their pain by any means, you know? And so I come, I come at this, I'm saying this from a place of love and not ignorance, but for me, what it means is I am not joining the conversation with anger or blame I look at it from the point of view that, yes, the police in the United States have demonstrated callousness, but that by, by, by pointing your anger at one person and, and searching for justice through you know, being arrested and charged, I think that, that it would serve us well to take a step back and recognize that the system as a whole needs to be changed and that, um, you know, that's where it starts. And it does start with us. It starts with how we show up for ourselves and then it starts with how we are going to show up for other people. And I think it's just such a, I think everybody in this world is at a different place in their life, how they're going to process it. Do they have the tools to process it? I think that's another really interesting conversation is what tools do you have in front of you or what tools can you find to help you process what well, you- now I think you're listening or hearing what I'm trying to talk about. Is because that- that's actually what I'm saying, is that the voice that we, uh, the all the programming and all the work that we're doing at the French, I'm doing within the Friendship Center currently, mm-hmm. has to do with building capacity. Building capacity is allowing space, creating space, and having, a, and I do mean creating, not allowing, creating space so that people can join together in a way in which they have the freedom of thought and feeling and the presence of spirit that allows each individual to understand their own journey because the battle isn't outside of us. The reality is it's happening inside of you. And if if I am not able to honor the the devil I hold and the angel that is with me, the evil and the good, the right, the wrong, the black, the white. If I can't hold that inside of myself in some semblance of balance, Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That's all I'm going to see outside of me is whatever that that war is inside of me. Oh, I love and that. that is that is the bottom line, and there is no getting around it, over it, under it. You got to walk through that, and that walking through that place is a fine, fine, sharp razor edge that you have to walk through, and it is not easy, and it is not fun. In that sense of, um, you know, a carnival ride, it is work and it is dedication and it is, it is going when there is no going to be gone through. It is still going. You have to move through that inside of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so the, the work we do at the Friendship Center is provide the space provide the the safety and the protection and the sanctuary for people to be able to do that work and build their capacity, build the capacity within each person to hold that dichotomy, to hold the paradox. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, and, And be able to allow themselves to hold that container, to weave that basket, to dig out that canoe, whatever way that that person um uh, the unique way each person has of building themselves building that container within themselves to hold that work and then to be able to bring that out in their voice so that they can walk in the community in a good way mm. and that means that they look at their their you know everything everything that they myself anything i've ever done in the world and I've not been a real, you know, good girl. I, I haven't. I don't wear white, you know, I because it just doesn't work. It, I, it doesn't stay white. It's all mucked up. I got I think- blood and I got chocolate and I got mud and all sorts of stuff on my white garments. You know, I think this is an excellent um, opportunity, actually, to take a turn on this conversation and talk exactly about that. But I want to discuss... Knowing what I know, um, which is just bits and pieces, about how you created the space within yourself to walk with all the polarity that is just human existence. Um, I I really want to delve into that. So we we all know that you um, are at the Friendship Center. That you had you know some definite beautiful experiences that have led you you know to be a leader and a mentor in your in the space that you are currently occupying. But how did you get there? So can can you tell us a little bit about that? Were you were you raised, were you born and raised in Lillooet? Where did you get your beginnings? Uh, but I was born in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, my father was uh, in the Navy and uh, my mom was a professional woman who worked in um, food industry, restaurant industry, that kind of thing. As a, a young person, my family moved a lot. That my dad was in the Navy and he was just retiring. Um, he, we went from the East Coast of um, the United States down to Mexico. I went to um, to school in Mexico and learned Spanish or probably a dialect of Toltec um, from because we lived in. Guadalajara outside Guadalajara in a village and uh I can remember the schoolhouse I can remember the smells and the people I have memories from then so I I had to have been about four to five years old then and I went to first grade there Mm -hmm. uh kindergarten I guess it wouldn't have been probably in first grade before we moved back to to Washington state um I think that probably living living there was a time in my life when I felt loved, when I felt um, cared for. But that care didn't necessarily come from my parents. It came from the women who cared for me, who were all uh, Mexican women and in community there. So uh, I have a deep sense of connection to... The Mexican culture to to the Toltec perspectives of life. Um, 
and my my sense of being inside of myself about possibility, about beauty, about connection and love. Mm-hmm. I, I, my my intuitive sense says that it it really it really um, was formed there with those people in that place. And I don't know, I it wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to be able to say thank you to them. I, I do say it in my prayers. I do. I do remember them often. I do um, walk with them in my life. Mm-hmm. And I've often thought it would be a great thing to be able to go back to that place. My um, parents are both dead now, so I wouldn't. I do have some pictures. Mm-hmm. But I imagine everything looks so much different now. So many years later, um, might be really hard to to reconnect with with those people or that place now. Um, but the, my, I I think that is where I I understood what it was to be a real human being was from them. And for whatever reason, that stayed with me uh, as we moved back to the United States, back to a little town. We lived on a, in the peninsula in Washington State. Okay. Uh, as a, a young girl, my claim to fame is that I used to play with Bill Gates on the beach. Um, we were kids together. Wow. We enjoyed <laughs> we enjoyed the outside and swimming and um that was the time when at that particular place, Hood Canal, the orcas used to come. <gasps> and I can I actually can remember them. I can remember being a kid waiting for them to show up like they were coming, you know, it's like you had this sense inside of you, they're coming, they're coming, they're gonna be here soon. And and soon enough they understand that the beaches were the kind of beaches where they could roll over the rocks and, and it would clean their skin. The pebbles, yes. The pebbles would help them clean their skin. And so it was a beautiful little, uh, little place. And that's, I carry that inside of me. I carry the beauty of that time inside of me somehow. And mm. it, it makes me feel, I have emotion fully that comes as I think those times um, and have those memories. Uh, and then uh, we created this thing called the hydroplane boat. And anyway, so we we created these things called hydroplane boats and started the hydroplane races. And when that happened, um, the whales quit coming. So I must have been about eight, maybe when that happened, seven or eight. I can re- I, and I can remember the disconnect, the the sadness about life being different. Mm. <laughs> um, and everything, uh, you know, life around us became full of uh, beach parties and. Uh, I don't know. There seemed to be a lot, a lot of, a lot of. Uh, my parents would have company that would stay. Uh, people were um, dropping in. It was a different time, a different era. So we would have been in the '60s, early '60s, around then. I would have been, yeah, '61, '62. Um, my father was pretty promiscuous he was he had affairs and he would take me with him my mom worked my dad was home he was retired from the navy at that time and he would take me with him so I I saw the things that he did and I saw how he behaved with my mom he was um always on the boat so I spent a lot of time at sea with him wow Um, I was his first mate um fishing um i was also the only one he had to beat on <laughs> when things were rough or he was drunk um 
there was a time when he he was angry with me for something I don't even I don't I don't remember the whys of these things. I just remember the the moments. Um, and one time he put me on a sandbar and made me get out of the boat, put me on the sandbar, the ocean, the tide was out. And he left in the boat and he left me on the sandbar. Wow. That must have been incredibly disorientating for you. Um, yeah, it was quite a... Uh, well, so it was an experience that brought me to a place of a creator, a connection with spirit, I think. Mm. It, it, it brought me into a deep connection with um, mortality, uh, you know, it, what am I going to do? I can't swim to shore. Well, maybe I can. I don't know. We'll see. And the tide came in and the water came up and and I was kind of faced with what to do and how to survive. So um, that was kind of my life with him. He would take me hunting. He'd leave me in the woods. Um, he did things that I know today that people who are psychotic do. That he he must have either the alcohol or his own wounding from the war um, or his own childhood, who knows? I don't. Right. Brought him to a place where he would he would beat me with poker irons from the fire, for example, and he'd hit my my shins. Uh, and he would he would beat me with a belt and I can remember going to school and as when I was a bit older it was, must have been about 10 and I we had PE and I would have to I would have to take showers at PE and then the kids would would say oh you put those bruises on with makeup you you know what I I internalized as a child there was something really wrong with me that this happened. Like I was the cause of those things. Um, and none of that makes any sense at all. Uh, and it didn't make sense to me as a kid either. And I can remember um, setting fires. I, I must have been incredibly angry. <laughs> uh, um, I can remember um, I can remember like stealing food from the kitchen and then one time getting so ill and really wretchedly ill and seeing rat poison. So it could be that he poisoned the food that he thought I would go for. I don't know. Those are, you know, they're snapshot images that you have as a kid that you have in your memories. Um, he, he would do things like ask me to walk, I, absolutely naked, walking across the living room with books on my head to to uh, to um, improve my posture. Um, I had to take piano lessons, but he would beat me because I didn't make the notes come out right or I, I didn't memorize a piece um I, he another thing he would do he really enjoyed having me stand on my head so I would that would be a punishment stand on your head in the corner um he would come into the bathroom and use a wire brush to to clean clean me for some reason like I was if I had a chance that's for sure I was out in the woods or I was in the I was in the water. I was somewhere other than in that house. That's for damn sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, I don't know. There was, it was just, it was all really his disorientation with the world. But some part of me was whole, even through all of that, mm -hmm. even through all of that. And I always, to, and to this day, I credit those women in Mexico. I credit them for that. That's so. I think that's what kept me alive, and the nature, and going up 
you know, I'd climb the trees, I would swim, I would be out in the world away from there. So I don't know, you know, the incest is another part of it that that doesn't, um, it no, never made sense. It, the stories were, I'm doing this so you know what will happen to you as you get older. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'll know what life is really all about. Yeah, it, 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 it was odd. It was just all very odd. I, I, at 55, did an adolescent ceremony to coming of age ceremony. And one of the big issues that I worked on was what happened to those bloody underwear? Hmm. What happened to that? Like, did no one see that? Or was there no blood? Like those pieces that you look at, you just in a practical sense to go, well, how could my mother not have known those things? Mm -hmm. How could she have not known that? And, and it may have been that she thought that it was a, a fairly, a normal thing. I can remember being in bed with him and her. Um, and those are those snapshot memories. Mm-hmm. Not that there was penetration, but there was, I was in the marriage, you know, the bed with them, with his hard penis and her nakedness. Um, and she always, uh, was upset with me. She was very Catholic. He was very um, agnostic. And I was always going to church with her. There was the Catholic thing. We, we just, we did that Irish Catholic thing. Um, And he would always say, well, she only goes with you because she likes the ice cream after church. You know, there was that, that was the kind of conversation between the two of them. And mom would, take me off to church and I would go there and listen to evil, you know, how you're born evil and original sin is not something you can get away from. It's part of you. You are that. And I think that stuck with me. That, that became the uh, other side of the beauty and the, and the wholeness that the Mexican women gave me. That was the devil and the angel sort of black and whiteness that I had to deal with in, inside, internally. And so young. And, what, what age were you at this point? Well, ca- the Catholicism was all through all of that. And of course, in Mexico, it was, uh, that was reinforced. Mm. So that there, it was wholeness, it was real, it was alive. But with my mom and dad living in Washington State, as I was seven, eight, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I left home at eleven. Mm. Um, it it had lost all the realness to it. It was just this Catholic um, dogma. Mm, and I never fit in. I never fit in in the Sunday school. I always asked questions they didn't like. <laughs> I, I, I just never fit in. I never fit in in school. I never. I just was not somebody who had friends. And my behavior was probably really odd. Like I was sexualized all the time at home. I. Uh, I probably was so rambunctious out with other kids that I would be off in the woods where they wouldn't want to go. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember one kid that I played with and he and I got lost out in the woods. That was quite an experience. I didn't know if we'd ever get back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, you know, those were places I think that... Um, that helped me integrate my spiritual 
spirituality. Like there was always a belief of some sort of help that that was with me. I always, I have always had that in some way. Um, I mean, the stories are just, they go on and on and on. I just, I'm kind of tired of them all actually at this point in my life. Yeah. But um, it, it, the experiences themselves have left with me the struggle mm-hmm. of trying to find and hold on to the goodness uh, of myself as a human being. And the same moment accepting the, you know, I, I lied, I cheated, I stole all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I I ran away from home all the freaking time. Um, I didn't stay in class. I didn't do my homework. I didn't conform in any way. I can remember one time smelling the exhaust on a school bus and the principal coming and grabbing me to get me away from there. Now, what would possess me? Because I thought that smelled good. What was that? Interesting. But yet that, you know, those are things I, I did. Yeah. Uh, and then at 11, um, going into the court system, I can remember I'd been, a, I'd gone into a, a detention home, kind of like a jail and um, crawling under the bed. I spent a lot of time there under the bed quite terrified um and away from my parents and I kind of felt safe but yet terrified so that was a real dichotomy kind of feeling um because I knew I'd done something really wrong right that that there would be repercussions for that and apparently my dad um, was quite violent uh, around town around that time. There, uh, some of the adults had told me stories later that he had been, uh, people were afraid of him, that the police were afraid of him. So he may have gone into some sort of, um, you know, psychosis, something. Mm-hmm. Um, At the time, did you, were you more worried about yourself or like when you were, um, in the cell and, and under the bed, or were you more worried about them and their reaction to where you were? Well, all of that. That I thought my father was probably able to get in there and get me. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, there was no there was no doubt in my mind that if he wanted to do it, he could. Hmm. And um, yeah, because he was invincible. Like there was no. He, yeah he was he was almighty um mom left home once I remember when I was I can remember her taking me away from him once and that had to do with him shooting at her with a pistol uh that she she left Mm. I don't know how that all ended up but I remember being in the hotel with room, room with her but after that I left home I ran I ran away a number of times mm-hmm. and one night um and the police would bring me back the sheriff would bring me back to the house and tell him you know quit beating your daughter and and the door would close and they would go away and he would just beat me um but one that finally they kept me and took me to the detention home. And from there, I can remember going to court. And when he walked by me in the courtroom, I peed myself. Absolutely no control. Just urinated everywhere. It was just that sort of uh, dynamic. It was pretty intense. Well, and that's your survival system kicking in as well and recognizing you know, um, physiologically that there was a very real threat to your survival. Oh yeah. And, and the, and the energy, the uh, the energy of that human walking by me. Holy crap. How did that feel to you? you, you (laughs) I can feel it right now. Well, and and that's what I was going to say is, is is you, you were telling us how you had held on, how you, you had that presence with you that you knew there was a very real piece of you that was very aware that you were 
um, spiritually, emotionally safe in some way. How did that part of you interact with seeing him for the first time in that courthouse? And, and how did that, that part of you, how did it help you break free to get to where you, um, started going down the path to get to where you were now? How did that piece of you interact then? Yeah, uh, it, it's, it, I was, uh, I was an individual, I was individualized. Mm. I was not a daughter. I was just me. That's and cool. from there, I ended up going to a, an orphanage. Okay. And um, most everybody in there was somebody of color, mostly majority were black mm -hmm. uh, people and others were people of color. And a few of us light-skinned folks. But you know what? I realized at that point in my life, and that, so I was 11, 12 years old. And what was going on then in the bigger picture was the um, American Indian movement was going on. And people had taken over um, Fort Lawton in Tacoma. And uh, that they were my heroes. Hmm. They were my heroes. They were the ones that were coming to free us, that were going to make it. I started to see that, or at least I lived inside that belief that there would be an end, that there was a time when, and they took over Cascadia. Um, what were they coming to I free said, from? What, I, huh? I, I don't know the story, so... Um, what what were they there to do? What were they what were they in search of? And the American Indian Movement. This was just after a wounded knee, and they were down in Alcatraz. They took over Alcatraz. Oh wow! They also took over uh, Fort Lawton, which was in Tacoma, and that is what is called Daybreak Star today. Oh, it's all been returned to the indigenous people. This is Robert Satyakam. This is a huge piece of American history. But I was in the institution looking out okay. at them. And that that individual that as an individual, I started to draw my identity from them. Wow. That's I mean, well that's because incredible. they they reflected back to me right. something that felt like it matched how I felt inside. Mm. And and I was with Black people who were fighting the Black Panthers who were fighting in, I mean, this was the 60s, right? And all of a sudden there was this, this purpose, this, the, something real something. was starting to happen. Mm. And, and, it be, and, and I internalized that in my character. I listened to the music. I listened to their words, and I and it felt so real to me. And I and what's you know I gotta say back about my dad was, um, and I only know this in the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. His family came from Halifax after the big explosion. They ended up traveling down to uh, the south down to uh, North Carolina, Tennessee, North Carolina. And um, he was probably, I, I, this is all my imagination, but now that I've researched the history, I mean, I'm related to some folks that are, are Confederates who are the cause of Trump being elected. That's part of my father's family. Okay. And he very likely rejected all of that. Uh, and, and he left home at 13 to join the Navy. He, he lied about his age. He, he created a, a world for himself in the military to get away from, I'm thinking, he, to, to rebel against the imposition of what he was supposed to be. So one of the ways he did that was through indigenous culture. Somehow 
I don't understand. It's a real missing piece for me. I don't know how he connected. I can't find it in our family. Okay. But he identified as indigenous in some, like, I knew how to tan. He taught me how to tan. He taught me how to hunt and fish. And I knew all of that stuff. Mm. I know, I remember being with indigenous people in those party days. I remember those, you know, I remember that part of our life. So my brother, half brother, long story, we're not going to go into, but his name is Tecumseh. Like, so my dad had that. So it was a part of me and a part of what I grew in Mexico that carried with me that I could see reflected back as that young teenager. I can't help but wonder, and I don't want to take you too off, far off course here, but um, you did mention, I believe that I think he was Scottish. He's, his heritage is, it's Hardcastle is my father's name. Okay. And so they come from the border, the Harden Castle. Because I, I, it's the border of Scotland and England. Okay. Because I do know, and I, from my own, Harden's Wall. Well, I just, I do know from like my own family history that, um, you know, my great grandfather was a Scotsman and he came over and he was a tra- uh, trapper and, and he married, my great grandmother and she was indigenous. And so I can't help but be curious if it's like you said, because your your father identified as indigenous and his family came from Scotland, if there wasn't some trapper history uh maybe somewhere in there. Just I I've looked back, I can follow his his family lineage back to the fifteen hundreds. Right. I don't I'm not finding it. Oh, okay. I, I've looked, but you know, it doesn't mean that it's not there somewhere. It just isn't what's been documented. Mm. Yeah. So, and I would think so too, because it was pretty strong. Mm-hmm. It was a pretty strong, I didn't understand the cultural disparity or the cultural, uh, the white man, native thinking, or indigenous perspective. I didn't get that until I was much older, that there was a difference in that. Uh, So it was all melded together for me for a long, long time. I've had to differentiate that for myself as I've grown older. I'm, I'm just at the starting point of that journey, trying to, trying to understand myself. So, so I don't feel like I can offer uh, any, any information on a conversation in that regard. So yeah, it's a process. It's part of that process that we, because we come into our own self, right? Who am I and who am I not? Mm-hmm. And that's a really important piece that we have to go through the. We have to go through that, and so I I think that it's, it's so the institution I ran away all the time. I was the kid nobody liked. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a residential school, but it was a res- residential school because in the in the sense that the same thinking that went around residential schools were what operated in the in the orphanages. It was the same thinking. Okay. What was different is I wasn't beaten for speaking my language, and and all of I mean all of those differences around being an indigenous person within an institution. I didn't have to go through that. I didn't have that experience is what I'm trying to say. However, the atmosphere within the orphanage is the same sort of atmosphere. I was less than, and and I could see how people were treated, especially the people of color or the black people, very different than myself in ways. I got all, you know, that environment was very, very clear for me in there. And I can remember in those days thinking I thinking that if white people don't believe that this domination is coming for them, they're in for a very big surprise because this kind of thinking is going to take everybody if we're not careful. I can remember thinking that at maybe 12 years old, 13, 12, about 12, right when I started to have my period, right around that time. 
it just became very clear for me that this thinking, this, how do I, don't, how do I even describe it? This way of being, the dominant society was going to come for everybody. It wasn't just about black people. It wasn't just about native people. It wasn't just about Asians. It was coming for everybody. Was it a, like a, a feeling of just dehumanization? You know, did it did it stem from, was it a cultural feeling or was it, a, you know, just a feeling about humanization and, and the farther that we are, the farther that we step away from... The socializing, yeah, this, how the dominant society was socializing people. They wanted everything. That they being, I don't know, the church, the, and now I would say corporations, that, that allows us to have those sorts of thoughts and ways in which it control all the people. It was coming for everybody. It wasn't about your race. It wasn't about the color of your skin. It was about domination and control. Anyway, it just became... It just became something that I, I knew, I recognized. Mm -hmm. and, and then I had uh, 13 different foster homes. I, you know, I just, I was the runner. I wouldn't, I didn't, I just didn't stay. I didn't, I didn't. And I had all sorts of experiences. I ran in, I did drugs. I, you know, had sex with everybody I could possibly have sex with because I think I was searching for God mostly. But I thought it was in a person or in a relationship or I was searching for relationship. Um, and But that relationship had to have God in it. My, whatever God was, which I, I, it was not Catholic, that's for sure. Um, I didn't know what that was. It was a feeling. A feeling of connectedness, of something that was real. Um, so got into a lot of drugs, hung out with groups of people that were doing things that were anti-establishment, mm. um, certainly did a lot of drug running for a while, um, and ended up, you know, one night with a guy who had a bunch of drugs on him, and I didn't think they'd say anything to me, so I took the drugs, and he got off and I got caught and that ended me into the court system. That would have been very frightening. It, you know, it, is, it was, I don't know, I was high. <laughs> <laughs> been there. <laughs> I was numb. It was fine. <laughs> I didn't feel it so much. It was just a thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it caused a, it caused a mess, you know. And then people who were mad at my father took it because my dad had died by then. Mm. People were mad at my father took it out on my mother in the courtroom. And I told the judge right straight up, "What the hell are you doing? Mm. Why are you treating her like that? I'm the one you're mad at." Like I, I, I know that it just mortified her, but I was pretty mouthy. Wow. And anyway, they ended up. Um, saying, you know, you could go to the Philippines if you want to. And so I did, instead of going to, to prison. That's how you was, ended up in the Philippines? Yeah, about 31 years, I think, is what they were going to give me. Wow. So why why did they offer you going to the Philippines? What was the... Well, I was with, I had been in a relationship with a guy since I was 13. Mm -hmm. So I was 15 then. Okay, And he was an airman in the Air Force. And so I went over there, got married. Third day after I got there, the airport got blown up. So I couldn't come home. And so there we were. And that's where I became a heroin addict and got involved with what became a, a resistance movement against Marcos, Aquino's government, who took out took over after Marcos was. So who, who was Marcos and, and the government and, and what was the resistance? Was the, I don't know if he was a president. I don't know if he was a president. Okay. I can't remember, but he was the, the head of the Philippines at that time. I don't know what they called him. It wasn't a premier. 
I don't think they called him a dictator, although they, his behavior was as a dictator. Mm -hmm. So he was the president of the Philippines. Now, this man that you married, was he, did he, was he into heroin? How did that relationship blossom and, and what did it feed you at that time? Like, what were you getting from the relationship emotionally, spiritually, mentally? Well, the truth was that I had fallen in love with his brother before. No. Uh, yeah. And he was in the army and in Vietnam. Okay. And that was before I went over to the Philippines. But then I met Marvin and they were musicians and it was fun. And we went to dances and, uh, and these were guys who you were, you know, you were kind of a groupie in a way I was, so that was, that was a thing at those time in those days. Right. I was, okay. and, and I suppose Marvin was um, a protector of some kind. I mean, it's certainly sexual. It was a very sexual relationship. Um, but also, he had a family. And and I remember living with him for a while. Uh, his father hated me. Um, I, but, you know, I loved him. At the, I, I loved him in those days. Mm. I, you know, initially, it was his brother, Lonnie, but it, that changed. I actually loved the man. And we we lived, you know, we built a life over in the Philippines for about a year and a half, I guess. About that, I came back at 17 um, and promptly got pregnant and started having babies. And we lived a life together. Where did you, you said you came back home, but where was home for you when you came back at 17? Back in Washington State, uh, okay. a little place called Hoodsport. Hmm. So what came next for you after you started having babies? Well, I mean, lots of things happened. I, I worked in a, at the hospital. I was, uh, you know, just trying to be, trying to fit in, try to be a human. Um, and things were okay for a while. They, they, my mom, I did return to a relationship with her. She was part of the kids' lives. Uh, we depended upon her. We lived on the same property with her. Um, we, t things were okay for, for a few years. And then, um, Lonnie, uh, burnt down my mom's house and that shifted. No, things shifted before that. I actually, what changed in my relationship with my husband was I got pregnant and the I had a uh, stillborn baby, hmm. and the baby was born on Christmas Day, and I uh, was in the hospital, and Marvin left me there. I, I just told the story to Riley yesterday. I, it's the first time I've ever really said it the way I told him yesterday, but he walked away. He He had to go have Christmas dinner with his parents, and so he left me, and... I birthed that child myself. Much the same way your mother birthed you by yourself? Oh, yeah. You know what? Now that you mention it, there is similarities to that. Mm. And the baby was dead. And, and he had dinner with his parents, uh, Christmas dinner. And that was the beginning of the end of our relationship. Um, I had another baby, and that baby I miscarried at home and uh, was bleeding, and he slept in the bed next to me. And you were all alone there. And that was the end of that relationship, because how do you do that? How do you do that? How does that work? I... It just doesn't work for me. It didn't work for me. And and it was really, really hard. And anyway, we, we, but we were still married and all of that stuff. And uh, we even became foster parents. And I was, what was I at that time? 22. And I think that we had a, a foster boy that came in and I ended up having a relationship with him, which I should never have done. Hmm. Uh, and then I got divorced. And then I moved, 
and I went to school. And that person came back into my life again, and that was ugly. And it should never have happened. And I can only say I was insane. That's all I can say. Drugs. I was doing drugs and drinking. And well, I think that you were you were in a real state of time of my life. Horrible. You were grieving. Uh, yeah, I was. You were out of your mind with grief and pain and sadness, and and all I can say is, you know, from my perspective, that I understand what I understand that there would have been driving factors behind that. You know, truly, the issue, the the hurt that I still grapple with is what I did that created situations that my children had to deal with and that was wrong and there's no part of me that did that well um i can only be accountable to it is all that i can be and um there's sadness there's just sadness there but you know that's a part of that's a part of uh, that what I was telling you about the we the Armageddon is inside of us, right? It's the way in which we hold the the ambiguity, the the paradox, the the it's not right, and yet I did that thing. And who am I? I had, am not in that time period. I also had an abortion, mm. and so I hold that in my. Honesty, I hold that as I I made a choice to murder that child, and I don't think anybody should not have an abortion. I don't. It's not a judgment I hold about it. It's just a reality that I know that someplace inside of me, I decided to terminate that life of that person, and that I have I'm accountable to that. Your feelings on that, calling it a termination of life. Mm-hmm. Is that is that what you feel in your soul of knowing, or does that belief is is that a belief system that was imprinted upon you uh, with the Catholic upbringing and the and the Toltec? Um, Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It is just a biological, real, actual truth, mm. and there's no getting around it. It just I chose. I chose that baby could have been viable. Mm-hmm. I don't know that, right? That's a mystery. That's a mystery. I made a choice. I took an action. I did that thing. My curiosity around that, if you don't mind me asking, do you think that part of your decision that drove that action, you were already grieving for two babies? You had already endured unimaginable loss and pain, not only being a child yourself and having come into the world the way that you did, and then your upbringing, but also having experienced, you know, the loss of two babies with a husband that, you know, in a marriage uh, where you didn't feel present. Do you think that that had any, any role to play on that, that you made that decision from a place of, you know, pain and experience and just in and and, and not an unwillingness because that would be an unfair statement but maybe you didn't have the emotional bandwidth or capacity to to be present for a child at that point when you were still very much so in, in a place of um pain and loss yeah i i agree those all all of everything that you just said is true and I they think that, well, I know that the fear of losing that child also played a part in the decision to, to abort. Right. No doubt. And it's also true that I chose to do that thing. And that you feel guilt for it. I don't feel guilt for it today. Mm. It's just real. Mm. And I'm sad about it. And I'm sad about the situation. And I feel accountable to that part. I I failed. I succeeded. Both of those things are true. 
I love that you're in a space right now where you're able to honor both of those truths and you're able to acknowledge that they are both true. Um, yeah. And, and you were, you were, you were in a hospital and doing some nurse work. How did you get to this beautiful space where you're able to hold both truths within yourself and not just hold them, but also share them with us here today? How did, how did you get to this place? You know, that's interesting. So, so I leave, I, I when after that I had my tubes cut, mm. tied, cauterized, and put inside my uterus. Half of an ovary has been removed during that operation. Mm. So then I'm three years into getting a nurse's degree in educating, and I had left school at what seventh grade. I don't even think I made it through seventh grade. And going to nursing school was quite a journey. I had to take a couple of running starts at that, but I I got in and I succeeded. And not only that, but I found out that I had a bit of a brain, and that I could use it, and I could I could I could bring my brain and my emotion and my care for others forward. Um. I had learned when I worked in the hospital when I was like 15, 14, 15 years old about death. I had uh, one of the doctors that was at the hospital said, I want you to come and see this. And he put his arm around me and I was there with a man who died. Um, And he taught me about how to be with somebody as they passed. And so I carried that with me. And I learned about nursing, and I and I kind of grew up a bit, you know. I kind of got a little bit of responsibility and respect for myself, and started to build again. Um, but I was still drinking, I was still drugging, and uh, pretty promiscuous. Still having a hard time dealing with life on life's terms, and so ended up. Um, meeting my current husband and 27 about that time 26 something like that Mm -hmm. and um I don't know why but Riley and I seem to just stay together through thick and thin for (laughs) these last 37 38 years um and what was it that drew you to him what was that? What was it that drew you to him at that? Yeah, sex. Sex. Sex was great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I liked his body. Nice. And he liked mine, you know, and it's some kind of, uh, we fought a lot. We fought a lot. We, there was a lot of, I'm leaving you and you're leaving me. And it was not fun. I mean, it was, it was fun. It was, it, but it wasn't fun. It was, you know, there was, we had dynamic and it, but it was sure alive. There was nothing, um, there was nothing boring. That's for sure. Um, I would challenge him and he would meet the challenge and uh, he would challenge me and I would meet the challenge and we just, and then we had a baby. Which seems very impossible of a feat, considering that that you had mentioned that you had had your tubes tied, cauterized, and placed back in your uterus. So can you can you tell us more about that? What a, that was a surprising day. I mean, the moment I realized that the possibility existed that I could be pregnant mm-hmm. was a, a moment of sheer. I would say ecstasy. Wow. I would say that that is as close to the moment of, to ecstasy as birthing. Wow. Um, it was transformative. And I also believe this is the reason we're still together is because we both knew that it was a God thing. Well, it's a miracle unfolded right It was a eyes. miracle. And he's had mumps, so... He only has part of his equipment. So we're, we were in a place of being stunned and 
I remember telling the doctor that did the operation that I was pregnant just because that felt good to do that. <laughs> and, um, anyway, so then we birthed her at home. We had a home birth and Riley was there to, to welcome her into the world. Oh, and that must have felt so, in, I mean, what an incredible experience after the previous um, time to be blessed with yeah. a partner that, that wanted to be present for that. So present, so and such a good father, so kind. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, it, to her, for her, it, it, I hope we gave her just nothing but the best, um, at least in those first years to, you know, of life. We, she never hit the ground, everybody carried her. We just, she was, she was gold. Um, I, the dynamic between. Riley and the first three kids, not not as easy, not as easy. There was personality stuff going on. There was, you know, ex, the ex and his life and his world and our life. It, we didn't do any of that well for those kids. They didn't have um, soft and cushy when life, say, I I regret lots of things about that. When you say those kids, you mean the ones that you fostered? No, I mean my our my the three kids of Marvin and mine, mm. Aunt Mercedes and Angela. Those oh. were those were hard times, but you know Riley tried the very best he could, and he worked and he provided for us, and he showed up. And and he he cared for him in his way, so he's going through all of his stuff around residential school, all of the stuff around uh, being al- alcoholic. Uh, all of that stuff was going on as well. It was really hard. It was hard for us, and we didn't know what we were doing. Mm. Anyway, we ended up uh, figuring out some stuff. Uh, there were, I think there were some DWIs and some things with the court, and we ended up in treatment. So this goes back to dealing with the uh, death of the babies. It was finally within the sweat lodge within because we went to an indigenous um, uh, alcohol and drug program here in Canada. Um, I think that was really the beginning of returning home for Riley. Uh, we worked through uh, six weeks each of us went independently for six weeks and we went back as a couple but it was in the sweat lodge where I finally was able to grieve the loss of those children and it was in the sweat lodge where I finally was able to hold the pain around that and be able to see it as my pain not what was the expectation of the people around me Mm-hmm. whether it was my mom and her Catholicism or or Marvin's mom and her, you know, women lose babies all the time. It's no big deal. Buck up. All of that stuff. I left it behind because there I had, and I get, I come back to this bit that the Friendship Center provides is they provided me safety and protection and sanctuary that allowed me to have those feelings and challenged my thoughts around it. That's magnificent. It is It is really the place where the mind, the emotions, the physical reality, and the spiritual holding creates some sense of container that allowed me to start building who I am, independent of all of that, all of that other stuff all of those other experiences, I could start to bring the wisdom of those experiences into something that could hold the uniqueness of who I am as the person. And if that can happen for me, it's then my job, my responsibility. It is, it is, it is my work to turn around and share that with others. That's what I owe. That's what fuels me that's what nourishes me is that i can give back to that lineage they gave to me i can turn around and help that happen for someone else 
there's nothing else to live for. Tell me, tell me more. Like, I just, I love, I really want, I, I would love for you to expand upon how you, how you find your, how you found your spiritual path. And it sounds to me like, I mean, it started when you were very young and you would go into nature um, in order to hold on to who you were. But tell me about the, the spiritual path that you started to take after the sweat lodge and with the indigenous community and the friendship center, how did that take you to China and Israel and to the, to the, to the Carol Mesa traditions? How did you find that? And what is that? I'd love to hear more. So the spiritual stuff that I was talking about as a kid that sustained me or kept some sense of, uh, natural law in my life some sense of that possibility uh, i left behind catholicism a hundred percent in the philippines absolutely turned my back on it as i watched people being crucified on the cross at easter and i watched people with leprosy out in front of churches that had solid gold altars i got married by the way in one of those churches in front of one of those so- solid gold altars with the lepers out on the front and the people with all sorts of communicable disease and poverty and whatever brought them to the cities on the steps of that church. Um, to where I left it behind. I walked out of there and I walked away from that 100% because there was nothing in that that was real. Nothing that what they had said was acted upon there was no truth in the words that they said in the actions that they brought into the world there was only hypocrisy so I left that behind which left a big gap between myself and my mom and her family Um, and I first learned about the Baha'i faith when I was in the Philippines Um, but I didn't actually turn towards that as a possibility until uh, before I left my first husband. But I had one of those moments where I was walking out to get the mail. And as I was opening the mailbox, I actually heard a voice in my head that was not a figment of my imagination that said, you are mine. And that was an experience I can't describe to you because I have no words for it. It was an interdimensional awareness that came. And uh, at that time, I was also part of a a, uh, strike at a company who was selling food products that were tainted. And so I was on a strike line. Okay. And um, most of the people who worked at that particular company were Baha'i. So they started teaching me about the Baha'i faith. Baha'i means light. Uh, It's a faith that is uh, established in 1844 here um, as part of progressive revelation It's an Abrahamic traditional uh, way of viewing creation and creator. Some people would call it a religion. Um, I don't see it quite. Of course, it's a religion, but all religions are only here to teach us how to have some sense of mental health, that religion is about our mental constructs. It's not about our spiritual realities. So for me, there was a felt knowingness of the truth of the words Baha'u'llah speaks that I could begin to allow into me. Now, uh, my issue around religion after um, leaving the Philippines was I want to if it, I want to read what's written in the handwriting of the person who wrote it. I don't want to hear King James version. I don't want to hear 
something that was um, translated by somebody else. I want to, if you say you're talking to God and you have something you got to say, I want to read it in your own handwriting or hear it from you. So that was the measure I challenged the faith to. Okay. And when I went to the, uh, sorry, when I went to Israel, I actually saw the Hola's handwriting. Wow. In a love letter that he wrote to his wife was the first thing that I saw in his handwriting. What what did the love letter like what was the love letter about? I mean, a love letter, yes, but what It was did, in Arabic and I couldn't read it, but I saw it. But you saw it. And it was written on turquoise paper. Wow. And at that moment, I went, okay, I don't understand any of this, but I see in the world what I wanted, my heart wanted. Mm. And it matched up for me. So I started trying to learn some stuff about faith and um, the teachings of Baha'u'llah. And uh, the premise of one people, one race of people, individual investigation of truth, the equality of men and women, mandatory education for all people. These are principles I could live by. Mm -hmm. Whether any of the rest of it was true or not didn't matter to me. Those became uh, structural for me. They became part of this is the kind of world I want to live in. And so whether this is true or false is, didn't become as important to me. Okay. It, it, that may, may not be true. But if I live my life according to these principles, it, even if it's wrong, I've lived a life that I can feel good about. Mm. And so I quit worrying about whether it was true or right or wrong, you know what I mean? If it was um, accepted by people or not accepted about, and maybe I was getting the wool pulled over my eyes or all of those things, I didn't worry about them anymore because it didn't matter. What I needed to do was live a life that felt that it had uh, some justice and mercy and um, served, had some service to it. All of those things became more important to me. That's, I mean, I think that that is not just so beautiful, um, but I, I just, I, I view that as a testimony to the goodness um, that can be found within. And then, and then we find it uh, expressed outside of ourselves. And then we're able to, uh, you know, almost like a hologram, bring it back in and and keep it going in uh, exactly. in a very beautiful circle. You know, and I, and I so that's that's that. So I didn't have. I, I, what was lifted from me was that struggle about. Uh, I, I mean, people have called me deviant. They've called me um, defiant. They've called me every. I just. All of those things, right? They, that you, which means you're not fitting in, and none of, some of that just didn't matter so much anymore because I knew what I wanted to do. So that is what move moves me forward. And if I can give myself that grace, then it's also my responsibility to uh, not allow because that's not the right word and i've used it a couple of times but it's not about allowing it all it's about um being willing to understand that this same process is going on for every other person mm -hmm. every other person okay. so that's that that becomes the framework the frame of how I try to live my life. Not that I, you know, I fuck up a lot. <laughs> Don't we all? I, uh, I, I remember I just said something for a very, very long time. My life was just one continuous line of wins and wrecks. And I mean, wrecks, <laughs> you know, there was more wrecks than there were wins for, for a very long time. In my life I over I, and over and over again yeah and you just gotta go with 
picking yourself back up and going back in and going, yeah, I get that. And I'm going to try it again this way. I don't know. You know, I, th- I think that, you know, opening up a dialogue is so important and, and understanding one another's language is, is really important when, when we try to put ourselves in, in that other person's shoes and, mm-hmm. And when it comes to faith and religion, I feel as though 100% in my heart, I feel like that's where the breakdown of connection begins. It begins because we don't have the tools to understand the next person's language. And yet when you stand outside the box and you listen to other people speak, you can you can see how what they're saying is is very similar in a lot of ways but that they're just using different words because they have mm-hmm. different tools for expression. And so I think like, you know, it, could you tell us more about, um, about your, I guess about your faith, tell us more about the fasting that takes place. Tell us more if you can, about mm-hmm. how your faith interacts with your husband's, um, faith and, and where does that bring you to, how are you able to find connection in a marriage, um, where you're both individuals, but also, you know, part of a unit, how does that work? Yeah, it's got a lot of ups and downs. That's for sure. (laughs) I like ups and downs. You tell us all about those. (laughs) Um, so decolonization is such a huge process it's just you and like Riley just said this thing this morning that just blew my mind and I love it so much it's really something he said if vanilla extract is brown how come vanilla ice cream's white (laughs) oh my gosh I love it (laughs) But that's how he th- he thinks in these sorts of ways that uncover those things that we take vanilla ice cream for granted as being white, mm-hmm. when in fact, when in fact, mm-hmm. <laughs> it it comes and derives from something that's brown. Yep the bean the beans actually look black to me. I, I don't they know do. if you've ever cut they open a vanilla bean do. pod, but. It's- I have. I make yeah. my own vanilla extract Perfect. from beans. Yes. So, but what a brilliant way of decolonizing. Just that, just that mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. decolonizing. And with humor. I love it. it. It is and it just exquisite. Exquisite. And that's the man he is. That's that's who he is. <laughs> it must have been quite the journey going through. We're, I don't want to say going through, but definitely going through, interacting, experiencing it as someone who loves him, and 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 watching him having to walk back through his own trauma to find his his healing path. And for sure, I mean, I. I definitely, as as a daughter of a man who died uh, a drug addict and tried to commit suicide six times because of generational trauma, to hear a story that is so triumphant, you know, that his spirit has been triumphant in his journey, to me, I don't know, it, for me, it just gives me so much hope and, and so much love. And I don't know, I just, I, I find it so encouraging that you two you know, had such rough beginnings and have endured so many things apart and yet so many things together as a team. And that Mm. 30 something years later, you have a miracle child and this incredible bond and friendship, and you're able to give back to the community that helped get, get your own foothold within, within your spiritual connection to not just one another, but also yourself. Those things are true, and at the same time, uh, we don't have great relationships with all of our children. Hmm. Uh, you have uh, almost all of them. As one of one of four, hmm. do we have a real, genuine relationship with? 
The others are in flux, different stages of story, different stages of development, different stages of interaction. One, I don't talk with at all. haven't talked with her unless she has something that she really wants to point out to me in life. Mm-hmm. I don't hear from her at all. Um, so that means her children we have no relationship with. Uh, another one I hear from here and there, uh, but all surface, all surface. Um, and her children um, are pretty radical. They're pretty outspoken. They're pretty dynamic kids, and I would love to be in their life, but I will not compromise their relationship with their mother Mm. to meet my need for relationship with them. I won't. So, um, and then I have another, uh, our daughter together, Riley and I, she's just gotten married. She's just starting a new relationship in her life. And... I don't, we'll see how that goes, but there's a lot of unspokenness. My kids, if they ever read or hear your broadcast or your podcast here, will learn things about me they had no idea of because they've never asked. They've never been interested. It's always been ang- their anger around uh, their response to my behavior in their past. What? Which is fair, you know, that's that. So Ryan and I have had to live our lives and maintain that we pray for them. We hold them up every single day. We Some part of us reaches out to them and asks for protection for them, care for them, hold them. And that's our job. And that's the way we can do that right now in life. Well, I also look back and this is just my opinion and, and I'm full of them <laughs> that they're often contradictory. However, I look at it, you were a different person every single time you had a child, you <laughs> were at different places in your life and your interactions that you had with them, every interaction would be different because you were different and they are different and they are, you know, everything doesn't come out with an instruction manual bottled perfect <laughs> labeled and tagged you know i i think that we're all stumbling through different um different spaces within ourselves you know i look at it like an accordion you know when you pull that accordion apart there's all these different layers within it and often people look at us with you know we're this we're this body and they they look at us and they see us for what we are presenting at that time. But then when you pull that accordion apart, you realize that there's all these creases and layers and folds. And, and those things hold the experiences and the personalities and the, you know, the traumas and the influx and our, our opinions and our interactions and our reactions. And every child would be different and, and should hold uh, a different aspect of you within themselves, but also a different version of you in their head. And, and it just stands to reason. I mean, the same is the same is true with me and my parents. I was the firstborn, uh, you know, and I look at the relationship they have with my younger sisters and I go, well, of course we're not, we don't have that same level of friendship or that same interaction or that same sense of security and love that we don't share that because, you know, I was brought up by the younger, more volatile, passionate, questioning, troubled uh, individual. And later on in life, when they when they were a little bit more settled and, and they each went off to have their own children, they were able to give, you know, a more healed perspective um, or part of themselves to the next child, right? And and so I I, I don't see anything wrong with that. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Where it's it's not unfair. In fact, I think if anything, it challenges us individually to become even better people. It challenges us to stand forward and and find that love and that acceptance and forgiveness, not just for our parents or for the people who raised us that might have given us different pieces of ourselves, but for ourselves, we have to find forgiveness within ourselves for the anger that we would have expressed externally 
when we felt slighted or wronged or left. And, and I always say this, which is that, you know, my own father, he never gave me what I wanted. <laughs> I mean, that man, not once, you know, but he always gave me what I needed. And, and I feel like, but that's just my faith. And that's how I view the world. So, I mean, I look at your relationship individually with your children and where they're at now. And I go, you gave them as much of yourself as you could, and you gave them what they needed to become the best versions of themselves. And whether you gave them challenges or you gave them the nurture or, you know, or you gave them a perspective that they wouldn't have had and, and that the, and that their brother or sister can't possibly have. I, I just think that there's so much beauty in that, but I mean, that's just me. And, and I look at you as a whole and, and I see, you know, the early beginnings and then where you are now, and I just think you're fucking magnificent. You're like a goddamn unicorn in my world. So <laughs> you're so funny. <laughs> you just send those children sweet. over to me, and we'll sit down and have some whiskey <laughs> coffee, and we'll talk her out. <laughs> yeah, yeah they'll, they'll they'll tell you the you know I've given you the pretty version of what they would tell you. They would give you um, you know I I didn't measure up. So that. For them, that's that's another reason why I said the stuff I said about my parents earlier about their reality in the world that they were at at that time. Yeah, was not the reality of me growing up within the Vietnam era and you know uh, hippie chicks and flowers and free love and you know heroin. Right. So it, it's very different, and they have their version of all of that. And their stories are just as important to them mm-hmm. as my stories are. That's not that their stories are wrong. They're just very different stories. And somehow we haven't been able to find a common ground in that yet. So maybe it will happen, maybe it won't. But I love them and I think they're magnificent too. Like they're my unicorns in my <laughs> <laughs> Because they're all beautiful, incredible uh, great parents, good people, kind. They're, and if I if if they need to internalize me as the devil in their life, mm-hmm. they're lucky because I'm a good devil to have. You know, I've always said that. I've always said we are all the villain in somebody else's story. Exactly. So I don't. If I'm, I don't if I'm that for them, so be it. Let let that be the worst they have in their life. Absolutely. I 100% stand behind that. And yeah. So, and I think, so the, the stuff around getting to the indigenous piece is that that stuff dad implanted in me in the experiences that he had, just like you're saying, right? He gave me what he gave me. Yeah. So I learned some stuff about connecting with spirit in ways that were a bit more challenging than a lot of other people have to experience, right? Mm-hmm. And I did that as a young person. So somewhere those initiation, the physics of initiation around spiritual integration Mm -hmm. happened for me. And Riley and my relationship with him uh, was a further unfolding of that truth that I carried from those experiences moving forward. And Riley's had his own journey with that. I, um, I went, I, I followed teachers. I, I had a teacher who was an esoteric uh, magician kind of dude. He was quite a handful. He, but he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot in terms of European um, mysticism mm. that, um, it, you know, is pretty terrifying. In it, At least it was when I, I was looking into it. Um, don't feel that way anymore. I get it. I grok it. I can see uh, the impact of uh, I can see of of um, masonry, for example, Rosicrucianism. Uh, I, I the um, theophysists, all of that stuff. I get that. He, I learned about what that was in the world. And how that could apply or not apply to me, what I wanted to take in, what I didn't. He was a, a good teacher around that kind of stuff. Uh, I turned away from that, didn't, you know, in the end result, it it didn't hold up to the 
the kind of justice and mercy that I was looking for in the world. It didn't didn't fit that. So uh, then I met Mary, who was a wonderful teacher. Um, of course, I'd gone to Round Lake, so I learned a lot about traditional uh, cultural approach to healing mm. and to uh, drug and alcohol. So there's AA was in that, um, and and fasting, vision questing, because there's seven sacred sacraments, right? The, the Sioux that uh, uh, Sitting Bull talks about that are the basis of Round Lake and how we came into healing, because we used the sweat lodge was a part of that. So the pipe ceremonies are part of that, all of those sacraments. So we learned that and became aware of that and what that could be. And then what did that mean to me as a, a white person for, from that part of my lineage? And how do I integrate that? And the children were raised in that. And in the meantime, we've got family members who were part of the American Indian movement, who are part of our life. Um, music that was a part of our life from the uh, from John Trudell, which was a big shaper of the kids' life, my life, Riley, our family life, um, drumming and singing, and all of that became part of how we try, we stayed sober. Fishing, um, summers together, canning, and and all the family together to do all of those that living the life and the culture and the place, you know, and the earth of Riley's family and coming back into the captain territory and being part of integrating that. And Riley had his own journey, uh, almost 10 years it took to go through the truth and reconciliation process. That was excruciating work. Mm. Um, just all, all these things and Mary started teaching us about the Caro traditions and doing indigenous the in, um, initiations and and learning how to to bring tools in and all along I was challenged with am I doing something wrong am I uh, I'm going against you know my thoughts about what a is right in the world and what's wrong in the world. And ugh, what a struggle. But nonetheless, being in the ceremonies and then going, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. Seeing seeing ceremonies of, of healing ceremonies where people are having back surgery using rocks that were absolutely exquisite in their perfection. And precision, and these people walking <laughs> afterwards without pain, and no blood, no anesthesia, no operating rooms, none of that stuff. Well, you know, the background that must have been. How can you walk away from that and say anything, anything but thank you, <laughs> thank you that it exists. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, Riley Riley went um, was initiated as well. We carry maces. We we work with stones. We say our prayers. Part of that is uh, vision questing. We we fasted. Riley and I have fasted together. We fasted separately. We continue to drum. We continue to sing. We continue to sh you know use the tools that have been gifted to us and. When we're asked, we show up. Mm. We don't go saying, you know, we're this or we're that. None of none of that exists. It, only if someone asks or some, it's what we should do. Then we try to show up and try to do the best that we can. Well, and I think that's a testimony to you're able to show up for others because you took the time to learn how to show up for yourselves. And, and that's, I hear, I'm hearing that you really learned, you applied, you expanded mm -hmm. your heart and you took the information in and then you did the best that you could with it. And the result of that is you're now able to be, you know, just a, a pillar of, of strength and support for the other people in your community 
through the friendship center uh, and also for the other people in your life. You know, no, we do strive. We do strive for that because those people who took their time, yeah, they took their time to teach us, to show us, to because they did that work themselves, mm. right? That, that, that's our, it's our responsibility. There's a bigger word than responsibility. I'm not sure what that word is, but there's another one. There's, it's more than just responsible. It's. I think it's, it is an inheritance personally. It's a. It is legacy. It is inheritance. That is true. That is. Yes. And and I think of it as it, like legacy. It's an inheritance and it's also a legacy because it's it's something that we've inherited the, not the responsibility, but the privilege of it. And and I think in today's day and age that that information has been misplaced perhaps um, mm-hmm. and lost, mm-hmm. that, that it is a privilege to, is. to, to be able to be, you know, help, to hold each other in that circle. Um, it's true. And, and it's also, it's a beautiful legacy that, that is our divine right to leave behind for, for everybody else as well. And wow. they, those people who shared that with us, mm-hmm. their prayers are what make it possible for us to do this. And if we don't show up and do these, show up in these ways, yeah, the all of that work that they did stops. And and the kids, the people that come in front of us, mm-hmm. they have the right to see those miracles, to feel those feelings, to be connected in those ways. It's our job to do that. It's because those people that taught us are they're dying, they're gone, they're past, they're on the other side. They walk with us mm. in in that spiritual sense. They walk with us in the world that exists that we're a part of, mm-hmm. that they are also a part of. But it's our job to do the actions, to take the actions today Mm -hmm. so that those people, those kids, the people that are coming have a world to live within. That's our job. Well, and and I, and I agree with you that it's so important. And and I'm speaking as a grandchild who's, um, you know, my family history was lost due to, um, uh, being colonized and, uh, you know, like my grandfather, my great grandfather, no, my grandfather, he told his family to marry white, you know, because of the racism mm. that was taking place. And, exactly. and the, the fear there, there was so much fear and so much, um, pain around his own heritage that he didn't share the stories with my family. And, and if he did, I'm telling you, they sure as heck didn't make it down to me. And I was watching a movie mm here just the other day and it was called wind river and in it uh, towards the very end the man was grieving the loss of his daughter and he was an indigenous man and he had painted his face with blue and white and another man came to sit beside him and have a conversation and and the guy goes like what's on your face and he says well this is this is my i can't remember the word he used it wasn't warrior face but it might have been you know he was he was bereaved at any at any point in here and he says, or maybe it's not, maybe it's just bullshit. No one's left behind. No one's alive to tell us. You know? <laughs> and that's really what, that's how I felt. I was like, yeah, there's nobody in my family to share these stories or to tell me or to teach me, you know, and it's like, we're all stumbling around in the dark and we're having to, to try to find all this information that's been, you know, ultimately taken and, and just the the torch has not been passed and so i'm so grateful that there's people still in this world that take it very seriously like yourself you know because even me i'm i'll be coming in and saying you know please teach me more teach me more about what is my blood right what is my blood inheritance what are these what are these secrets and words and whispers that i hear but that i can't actually grab you know mm-hmm. um and I, and I just i think it's really important and it's so beautiful it, it is. It's part of natural law, and the natural law is the law we need to follow. The natural law, the natural. not the man-made law. Natural law, and that exists. It is real. It is true, and it exists today. Mm-hmm. I, and that's what we need to guide us. Absolutely. 
Well, I mean, I don't, I could talk to you forever, Kate, but I'm going <laughs> to, I'm like, I'm I like, I, want, covered it. I, yeah, I think, I think we're powering down here. I, uh, I think that we covered so much today and I just, I just want to say thank you for honoring us with your story and, you know, bringing us into your space and, and into your experiences and, um, and sharing us, you know, with us, your truth. I mean, that was, it was such a powerful story and, and I'm just so grateful for, for your friendship and for you sharing that with us here today. Thanks, Rianne. It's an honor. Uh, and then I say truthfully. Oh. All right. Well, everybody, um, if you, uh, if you want to hear more about Kate, uh, Kate, where can they find you? Is there, is there any place where people can find anything else out? I work for the Little White Friendship Center and, um, so that's, and I live here in Lillooet and that's about all I got. <laughs> so, so if you, if you're, if you want to have a conversation with Kate, if you're more curious about anything that she talked on today, uh, you know, Google. I have a Facebook page. And Facebook page. Facebook page. I'm going to put everything <laughs> in the show notes for y'all. If you are, if you're interested, we'll put it in the show notes and, um, and they'll, they'll find, they'll find you that way. Kate, how's that? How's that? Well, no I'm worries. Like stuttering. Yep. I'm like, <laughs> you're like Forky the pig over here. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot, Brian. You have uh, a wonderful rest of the day, and I hope that we see you up here soon. Oh, that's that's the goal. That is the goal. I keep being- Disclaimer, this podcast is for informational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions or viewpoints of the host, producer, other guests, or sponsors. I, Rayan K. Irving, am not, nor have I ever been, a doctor or therapist, and none of what I say is intended for professional or medical advice.